I'm going to go ahead and share screen and get to and then let me know if you can see everything and it looks like it should. Yep, it looks good. Yes. Okay. All right. Wonderful. So welcome everybody. Nice to see you again. Courtney is going to be handling a lot of the first part of this, the first half of class tonight. Again, our names and our email addresses are on here. Uh, so if you need to contact us for any reason, please go right ahead. So I'm going to go through, we talked last time about the intersections between brass band music and rap and bounce in New Orleans and how intimately connected they are. We talked about the Soul Rebels, which were one of the first brass bands that really had um, a really strong rap tradition in their music. We talked about Tulane Jazz Studies becoming the BAM program, the Black American Music Studies program, and why. We mm -hmm. went through some aesthetics of Black New Orleans music, um, and why, for so many reasons, rap and bounce were the sound of New Orleans, and yet they were really invisible in a lot of the um, public domains and institutions within New Orleans. So we talked a little bit about that. Racial, racial pathology and the coverage, the journalistic coverage of jazz music is nearly identical to early coverage of rap and bounce in New Orleans, even using the same kind of words, the same kind of references to drugs, sex, violence, criminality, all those things. So there's nothing new there. And the NOLA Hip Hop Archive, we pulled information from there and we did an introduction to bounce. We went through some of the earliest big songs, Gregory D and Manny Fresh Buckjump Time. Ricky B, we listened to Ricky B. And now we arrive at week two, moving further into the 90s. So I wanted to, we keep throwing around these terminologies. So I wanted to first start with, um, if Courtney could tell us the differences between rap, bounce and hip hop as terminologies. And obviously these things are fluid and flexible and they aren't deterministic, but if he could talk a little bit about that to start us off. All right, so, so hip hop is the whole universe, right? Um, um, rap is one of the four elements of hip hop, as you all know, is break dancing, DJing, um, um, MCing, and graffiti. Um, but bounce is the sound that came that we added to the whole spectrum. Um, <clears throat> and it could be divvied up because, you know, like most of these things, they're hella nuanced, right? Um, but now it's, it's there's a novel side of bounce that, um, you know, that, that's just this hardcore, sort of what you get from a Big Frida record or a Nicky the B record or something like that. But in the beginning, um, bounce was more so the bed of music and you would have more distinct verses, um, like a standard rap song with a little bit of uh, call and response or, you know, a, a sort of a chant and phrasing thing um, before. But the bed of it all is bounce. And you, like I say, you could kind of get a subgenre of it. So you may have like a big Frida style, right? But then you would get a song like Back That Ass Up that's, that has a hook, verse, hook, verse um, with a little bit of call and response at the end of it. Um, so, you know, it could kind of get gray on that side of things, but, uh, you know, but hip hop is the universe, you know, uh, rap is the territory and bounce is a regional sound that we brought to the whole spectrum. If that's clear to everybody. Um, so we're going to move into, uh, bounce rivalries. Um, and it's, and, and as I said last week, it's a lot similar to, the way bounce the, the sound grew in New Orleans was is almost mimicked uh, hip hop in the Bronx, right? Um, it started in the park with the DJs, outside in the DJs, or parties with the DJs. Um, it, it was all about the DJ, and then somebody would get up on the mic and keep the party going. Um, and then once the actual sound, like when rap became defined um, and the MC became just as prominent as the DJ, if not more important, then you started having crews, right? And we started having. Um, one of the earliest battles was between UNLV, um, which was one of the early artists on Cash Money Records. Um, 
And then there was Partners in Crime. And they were on a local label called Big Boy Records that was based out of Holly Grove. Um, those two will go back and forth. Um, and they were both from uptown, but Holly Grove was pretty much the west side of things. Excuse me. And um, UNLV was from the third ward, which is technically like maybe a mile and a half, two miles away from each other, three at most. But they were from the third ward, Magnolia Project, Six and Barone, that area. Um, and UNLV stand for Uptown Niggas Living Violet. Um, you had Manny Fresh making all UNLV beats. You had Precise making all the uh, Partners in Crime beats. And, you know, these things started from literal tapes. We made a song, it got hot. And of course, like the next thing to do, sort of like the Juice Crew versus BDP, which was Queens versus the Bronx in New York. Um, you know, they would, uh, they made the, I forget the name of the song, uh, MC Shan made it, then KRS-One responded with the bridge is over. So UNLV song was, uh, talks, talks, what is it, talks some more shit, right? And it was, this standard bounce cadence where it was, you know, it was rooted in uh, what they call tricking, right? You know, uh, if you if you give me some, I'll buy you a pair of shoes type of deal. And then Partners in Crime came with a song called Pussy in a Can, and it was going directly at those guys. And that really, the, the rivalry drove the popularity of the music. Um, this stuff made its way onto the radio. As raggedy as the, the audio was, uh, it still cut through the distortion it still rocked the clubs. It definitely was rocking the uh, the Sony Walkmans at the time. You know, if you was on the bus, that was coming out the headphones. Uh, you know, of course, at that time, we didn't have streaming, so whatever was the music, you would actually get the opportunity to live with a record for quite some time. Like, you know, uh, people drop a song pretty much every other day, every other week, but this this beef song will last for months and months, and you probably have to wait months before you even got a response from it. But it drove the popularity of the label. It drove the sound. And ultimately, it benefited the culture as far as its popularity. And uh, and then, you know, that were the, the people that came behind it that would do their own rendition of it or their own Xerox copy, Xerox copy of it. And uh, that added to uh, the overall sound. So the beef kind of grew because UNLV was fooling with partners in crime. They were going back and forth. Then there was another label mate on Big Boy Records that you all know as Mystical. That was his original label, Big Boy Records. Um, and then Yellow Boy, who is said to be kind of like the star of UNLV, who's no longer with us, he was murdered, but uh, he had the most signature voice, you know, he was sort of the Buster Rhymes of, of uh, UNLV. Um, he had a song called Drag Him Up the River that went directly at Mystical. Uh, Manny Fresh did that beat, His production was out of sight. I believe he took the Dragnet uh, sample, and dun, 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 dun. and uh, it, it, it was an amazing song. It was an amazing song. It took over the airwaves. Um, I forget the name of the album that, that it dropped on. Uh, it escapes me. And it's, it should have, I should have put that in the notes. But it really drove that album. There were billboards up of it. And to say it was a diss song, that sucker was jamming like like it was nobody's business. Like, it, you know, it, it was just nobody cared that, cause we were still like Mystical, listen to Mystical, but we gonna sing this song cause this sucker jamming. And uh, then Mystical responded with a, here I go. Um, and, it, and Mystical eventually went on to get a deal with Jive uh, Records, which was ahead of anybody from Cash Money doing anything on a national level. So that really pushed his popularity in the whole nine. And uh, then other, you know, uh, labels started popping up. You know, have a smoked out records uh, then the downtown, a uh, few guys from downtown, like LOG, uh, y'all be having G's, you be having soldiers. You had the Fila Fields with the Where My Hustlers at. Um, then going back uptown, you had Dolomite with the um, Hustler Hustler, which had a, a marvelous dance to go with it. I, I, you know, that song come on, I do that dance till this day. Um, and it was just an exciting time, but the rivalries really drove the music and made them play it more and more in the clubs. Um, and, it, and it was a thing to witness, um, as opposed to just, you know, listening to it because, ah, this is a cool song. It was like you was watching hip hop history happen, you know, and it actually had a narrative to it. Um, and, and the and funny a, part, said again? And a drama that, you know, really kind of engulfed people and brought them into the whole thing and made them personally invested. Right. And we're also going to talk about, we're skimming over Mystical right now, but we're going to talk about him in detail next week. Yeah. yeah. He had a, um, 
was a second round of success beyond, you know, the big boy records and even the jive deal, of course, with No Limit. Um, so, you know, big boy records, again, based out of Holly Grove, right there where, where Bounce was founded, if you will. Um, so not only did they have Partners in Crime on the label, they had Mr. Core on the label. They also had Fiend uh, on the label, which we mentioned last week. Um, he had the song Baddest Motherfucker Alive. Um, nobody really had that baritone voice like he had. So he was like the Barry, Barry White of, of the whole thing, you know? Um, who else was on that label? Uh, Black Menace, that's with J-Dog and Threat. Um, J-Dog's son is now with Young Money Records. So uh, J-Dog is a tough artist. He, 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 even at his age, he's in his late forties, he can still tell, that, tell down a microphone. Uh, he's, a, he's a super, super duper skillful guy. Um, but that roster was something serious, precise did majority of the beats. That was another beautiful thing about the time and how the sound was able to be so defined was because most labels had like a singular producer that would really, you know, create this sound. So you got consistency out of this label, you know, just like Manny Fresh, he pretty much did the first 10 years of Cash Money Beats um, or, or longer. Um, so they're precise with Big Boy. And, you know, they all had their own sound, but it was still New Orleans, you know, and them sucker was jamming. Um, but then in the midst of that, while that was going on, you still had uh, somebody like, uh, I may be familiar with the song now, it's called Get the Gat, um, but the song's 20 some years old. It's by Lil Elk. Lil Elk was a part of 3-9 Posse. Um, 3 9 Posse was from the third ward, um, but not in the project. It was a neighborhood adjacent to it on the parkway. Um, and Lil Elk was one of the members of that group. And that record took off. The The beat was, the drums were very, you know, in no as far as they had the bounce and the bop to it. But most, like most hip hop records, it was filled with breaks um, and, and melodies from other songs that were popular. Um, at the time there was, uh, what's the name of that group? Black Sheep. Black Sheep, uh, you could get with this or you could get with that. They sampled that. And, uh, and that really took off and it had a resurgence in the last year, I believe, or a year or two, I believe, due to the social media comedian or whatever, subtweet Sean, he created a dance and it took off, which was a beautiful thing to see something to be so local. 20 years later, have a new life and, you know, created more revenue for uh, Lil Elk as he now, he's now an older statesman in uh, the music community down here. Um, get into the next couple of weeks that's a theme that we're going to touch on over and over again how people more so now than ever continue to pull from the early years of new orleans rap and bounce to create national and international records beyonce is doing it right. um, you know drake has done it um tons of people so Chris you, brown Nicki minaj you name it you see it over and over and over again as an organizing theme so one other thing that we wanted to touch on before we move forward is the importance of the record stores. So right now we're in like 1992, 93. Right. And the importance of the local record stores cannot be underemphasized because um, not only were a lot of the people who made this music employed there, so Mia X, for example, who we're going to talk about today, she worked at a local record store and at Peaches, and the owner allowed her to perform there, to sell her tapes out of there. Oh. You see Odyssey Records and Peaches Records were two of the main record stores, and they just had an overwhelming impact on the creation and support of this music. Correct. Correct. And um, so you had Peaches, which was located at the corner of Gentilly, if anybody's in New Orleans. Uh, Gentilly and Elysian Fields, roughly. Um, they didn't move downtown into the Jack's Brewery building and now it still exists on Magazine Street, which is a beautiful thing because it's a staple. There's so much history in there. A lot of these records you can get, but for a marked up price for sure, because now um, what once was just a unit of music is now um, a collectible, like a novel piece to have. So, you know, to get one of these CDs, you may be paying somewhere close to 50 bucks now, you know, much like you know, getting a classic vinyl or something like that. Again, you'll hear me say this a lot because I never thought it would come to this, but it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Um, but Odyssey Records was located in Carrollton Shopping Center. It was at the foot of Holly Grove. Um, this place was important because this is where Lil Wayne met Baby and Slim from Cash Money. 
um, and they gave him his bit. They gave him their business card, and he would call every day and leave uh, verses on their voicemail until they would respond to him. And at the time, he's about nine, ten years old. And um, this is at the time when Cash Money is starting to get that local success when they had the artist Pimp Daddy, who's no longer with us. He had the song Gots To Be Real. They had the, the reggae flair to it, if you will. And um, Lil Wayne <laughs> named himself Shrimp Daddy because he's such a you know a small guy. Uh, that was his first rap name. Um, but he really looked up to another Cash Money artist who was from Holly Grove named Lil Slim. You see him on the slide. Um, and that's who he wanted to be like. That's, that was his first inspiration. He wanted to be like Lil Slim. I think he believed, I believe he dropped, Lil Slim dropped about two projects with Cash Money. Um, Thuggin' and Pluggin' um, was one of the more popular ones. Um, but from there, you know, Lil Wayne became, which is what you see now, you know, they, they, they brought him in, had him come into the office. Um, the office was located on airline at the time. Um, he would come in, hang around, and just try to get it in. Uh, I actually went to school with him. He was two years behind me, and he literally is what you see today. Um, I mean, my tattoos, but he would rap everywhere he went. Anytime there was a mic, he wouldn't be in class. He'd be in the hallway, beating on the windows. He literally rapped his way to the top. You know, that's how he got him with cash money, and that's what brought him to be one of the most popular rappers in the game today. Again, another beautiful thing to see. Another note about Odyssey Records um, One minute before you go on about Odyssey. So another <coughs> fact is that when Lil Wayne was very, very young, he did all of his earliest production with Don B. And for those of you New Orleans music enthusiasts, you may know Don B because he is the son of New Orleans famed producer Dave Bartholomew. Right. Who produced all of the major New Orleans rhythm and blues hits for, um, you know, 40 years. Right. So Again, that's another tie that ties everything together and we see the musical fluidity that happens in the musical circu circulatory system that right. North music operates within. Sorry. Right. Now you good. Um, but DJ Khaled, um, DJ Khaled lived in New Orleans um, when he was younger. I can't remember if he was born here, if he was born um, overseas where he was from, but he definitely spent his teenage years here. And he was definitely a DJ um, working in the store at Odyssey Records, you know, so a little hip hop history for you there. Uh, so he knows about the city well. Um, and those two would hook back up in Florida cause you know, they moved, Lil Wayne and them moved to Miami. Um, Cali was based in Florida and he really got his, uh, his weight up um, by touring the entire state of Florida up and down every weekend. He was in a different city, different set of clubs, dropping a new mixtape and really getting um, the, I would say the third round of cash money success uh, going once like BG and Juvenile and all those guys left the label. And it makes us wonder, you know, on what level kids, this is not happening now, you know, with the record stores have now largely closed. Thank God Peaches is still in business, but that's an anomaly. And okay. with, with that lack of record stores, kids are learning in a different way. Teenagers are having to circulate their music in a different way. And all of it has an effect on the sound of the music ultimately. Correct. Moving forward, so a lot of times when we talk about music, we talk about music in a vacuum, right? Like the sound of the music, who's producing it, and rarely, if ever, we do we talk about the way the music actually looked. The imagery, the clothes, uh, the fashion, everything that comes along with it. So we wanted to take a minute tonight to talk about that. We're still in the early 90s right now, and we're going to talk about Polo, who is one of the earliest documentarians of New Orleans rap and bounce culture. He's still working today. He's a photographer, and Courtney can tell you about him. Yeah, so uh, I believe his real name is Thaddeus Terrell or Terrell Thaddeus, but everybody knows him as Polo the Picture Man. Very tall, slim guy, as you can see in this picture. This is a recent picture, and um, you can see he's draped in Polo from head to toe, and you will never see him without in some type of polo apparel on. He's very true to the brand. Uh, and it's, it's a heartwarming thing to see. Uh, it's, he's he's a well-polished character in the music scene or just the, the cultural scene in New Orleans um, and his archives. So if you've ever been to any events in the eighties and the nineties, Polaroid pictures were the thing. You went to a concert, uh, they would have an airbrush background. I have pictures. I actually used one for an album cover. I think we were at New Edition of the Fat Boys concert with me and my brothers 
and my dad sitting in a peacock wicker chair um, and you would pay like five bucks for this Polaroid picture at this event. He would do this at all the clubs, all the DJs, as you know, anywhere he can. And, and of course, you know, Polaroids, they only came so many in the pack. So he had to buy like hundreds of dollars worth of Polaroid film and, uh, and do this. Uh, I'm so glad he did it. I'm so glad he's consistent because there's very little archival um, images from the time a lot of people's lost stuff in the hurricane, so on and so forth. But these pictures really paint the look of the of the time, um, the fashion, the the mannerisms in the picture, the hairstyles, the gold teeth, the jewelry. Um, it was really a sign of the times. Um, one of the, the staple um, pieces of, of, of clothing was uh, the Bally's. There's a Bally brand, but the specific silhouette of it was the uh, the animal Bally. That you, if you had on some Bally, some animal Bally, you really you really had something. It, it was a sign of success. It was a sign of style. Like I, you know, I I, I got it, and um, and I'm gonna let you know I got it when you had on these Bally's, and you know it was traditional to wear with a fresh polo, um, something like that. Maybe some khaki pants or some Jabot jeans or something like that. But uh, these Polaroids would, would capture that. Right here, you see uh, an early picture of T.T. Tucker, as you can see on his shirt, it says where they at, where they at. Um, that's definitely an uptown ball fade he got right there. Uh, that's, that's something we would all have. He was fresh if you had that. Um, what we got on the next slide? I'm hoping we got one, one of the Polaroids. All right, so this is an early picture of Lil Wayne. So Shrimp Daddy, you're looking at him, right? He got the leather visor on, the starched up jeans, a pair of felines, basketball jerseys. This is this is Trump Daddy right here <laughs> with the bush, you know. Um, what we got after this slide? All right, so here's one of the infamous airbrush backgrounds. Um, this is sort of like mid '90s right now because he has on a Maurice Malone shirt uh, with the Air Jordan and stuff. But this picture background, he saved a lot of these uh, backgrounds. So when he comes out for events. Now he breaks out a few of them. Um, I mean, he, he has hundreds of them available. And, and that's what it was all about. I'm going to get fresh. When I go there, I'm taking this picture because this is, a, you know, there were no cell phones and all that. Only the picture man had the camera in the building. And there you go. And it was all about gearing up and being ready to stunt for this. You know what I'm saying? What we got after this one? I, I grabbed quite a few. So this is Polo. I believe he took this picture. This is MCT Tucker and DJ Herb, who we mentioned last week. As you can see him, he got the felines on his feet. They both got on eight ball jackets, you know, the flat tops, ball fades, gold teeth. This is this is New Orleans. This is what it looked like. And to me, these guys used to look like giants, you know. Um, everything that they had on, you couldn't tell me that they wasn't king of the streets. Uh, what, what we got afterwards, after this one, you know. Things were colorful, as you can see. Um, I mean, the world ain't changed much. It's all about ass shaking, showing your ass. So it was definitely something that there was on then. Um, and now you see airbrush backgrounds. That's classic polo picture, man. And that really, that, that, that shaped the times right there. Which, what we got after this one? I wanted to catch polo. All right, so this is a this was the footwear. This became what they called the G-Code, which was established by a cash money artist. Um, that's, we refer to it as a soldier Reebok. Reebok calls them classics. The silhouette that you see of this shoe is uh, a Reebok classic that we refer to as soldiers. Now this particular model was something that Polo the Pitcher Man and a producer down here named Chase and Cash, they did a collaboration with Reebok to do a custom shoe. Um, so you have the camouflage bottom to it. Um, you see there's the Floyd de on the strap and they ran the Reebok down the side. But it was the same silhouette Minus all of the colors, you either had them in black or you had them in white. Sometimes they would have this uh, like manila manila folder colored uh, sole to it. We call them the gum soles. Um, so you could have that in black with the gum sole or white with the gum sole. But the G code was that you had these with a pair of jabos and a white t-shirt and a soldier rag. And that was the uniform of the streets at the time. That was the look at, at the time. What we got a lot of that next week when we delve into cash money and juvenile hardcore because they all wore that yeah straight up straight up uh what's the what, what's our next slide and see right here can i ask a question yeah yeah go ahead. 
hey, why? Where are they getting the the backgrounds? Where are the where's this all taking place? So, um, so airbrushing was really big in the early '80s. I mean, uh, early '90s. Um, so there was you know all type of artists that would be that would that would do it. Um, Cause they, they would also do clothing and stuff. So like there was a Woolworth on canal. I remember when I was young, um, you could go in there and sometimes it'd be in the mall and you could just pick out a visor, a hat or a t-shirt and you could tell them what you want on it, what color, your name. Like my last name is Nero. I never forget. I got mine with a, with a gold brick wall. And, uh, but my Nero, my old look like a D they, so people were calling me nerd. I hated it. But, uh, yeah, you could, there were these guys around the city that, that was a service available. You, you know, if you wanted a backdrop, you could, they, they, basically it was just a sheet, a white sheet, right? And they'll spray it up and, you know, and they have a signature and then they eventually moved on. So this is Suno's dance, this is 1990. So you can see these guys, uh, the guy on the left, I believe he has on used jeans, that's a brand, used jeans. And that's when it was, became real popular to buy your clothes with the holes in them. And I believe that was a major damaged shirt. Um, and the shoes they have on their feet, both of them, those are ballets too. That's not the animals, but those are ballets. I believe the ones on the right are mirages, and I forget what the ones on the left were, but these were like, these were the shoes to have. Like if you had ballets on your feet, again, you were the man and you were doing the right things in life. Um, so it was all about hustling, getting the money, because of course this is the height of the crack epidemic, the, the, you know, the drug war, if you will, or whatever that was going on in, in, in all inner cities at the time. And uh, you know, you would hustle to put this on and look and, and look like these brothers right here. Um, what's our next slide? And here we go to those are the animal ballets right there. Um, some expensive shoes. They were like five, six hundred dollars then. Bally actually stopped making them. They had discontinued them, and literally people wrote letters for probably the entire ten years. They were discontinued, and. Uh, the people begging ballets to bring this back out and they actually did. These ballets are now available again. Um, the CEO or president or whomever, the heirs or whatever, um, they actually did a release down here. Um, Cause Swiss Beach, the producer, he was working with ballets at the, at the time. Uh oh, you froze. Oh, there you go. You back? At least it's a it's a decent shot of them. <laughs> I know. Whenever that happens and somebody's caught in an uncomfortable, yeah. oh, there you are. There you are. All right. What's the last thing y'all heard? Sorry about that. Uh, Swiss Beats and Bali. Okay, so Swiss Beats was the brand ambassador, um, and uh, a videographer, a director down here named uh, Benjamin Simmons, filmmaker. Um, I actually went to school with Ben. He created a documentary around it. They went, uh, did a debut event at the Orpheum Theater to bring the ballets back to where they screened the uh, the actual documentary. There was an after party afterwards. The heirs to ballet were there. Swiss Beats was there, and all of all of the all the guys in the city. They either brought out their new ballets that they purchased, or some people actually held on to their ballets and then brought them out. Um, so again, humongous staple in this community, um, still is, you know, people are ecstatic that they brought out. Now it's more like OGs wear them. I don't think the young guys wear them, but you could rock this with anything. A pair of jeans, shorts, or a tuxedo, and they're gonna respect your mind for it. Um, or rather give you, you know, the seal of approval for it. Um, with the eight ball jacket, you know, that was this, this was a hustler's trophy right here. You know, you hustle, you hustled up your money and, uh, and you stayed fresh. Now this is interesting right here. Uh, you got the airbrush background, but as you can see, we got these fully automatic weapons in the picture. Um, this being a port city, um, you know, a lot of this we get we get a lot we get a lot of more merchandise passing through, whether it's from a train, uh, the shipyard, so on and so forth. Um, it was very common to see these weapons around. Um, you, they're literally in the club with these weapons, taking pictures of them. Something you would never see. Today, this is incriminating evidence, but there was no internet, right? So only people that had this picture was the guy that took it and he had it sitting on his mantle at home. Um, 
but this was the sign of the times. This probably is somewhere close around 1994 at the height of uh, the, uh, when we were the murder capital, um, you know, there were a lot of money in the street, drugs in the street. There's a lot of danger, a lot of violence, a lot of things going on with the drug trade. And this was sort of a part of the culture. Um, and if you ever take a look at Polo, pitch, Polo the Picture Man's archive, like on Instagram, you will see several pictures, even himself in the picture. He had an Uzi, a uh, MAC-10 in his hand. And, and I mean, this, was, this was New Orleans at the time. So all of this bounce stuff that was going on, the whole nine, this was the element, this was the essence of what was going on. It was dangerous, it was fun, it was colorful, everybody was young, and you know, thankfully the music survived, but this part of the culture died. Um, nobody in the club taking pictures with oozes no more. Thank God, <laughs> thank God. Now, this hairstyle, you see that I bang. <laughs> this hairstyle, from what I understand, I recall, they refer to it as stacks, right? You're correct. Yep. That's, that's my <laughs> yeah, that's stacks, right? Oh, uh, you see the door knocker earrings. Yep. No. Yeah. Well, it looked like Shorty on the right got some medallions. They're not door knockers, but she got some medallion <laughs> earrings. So you can see that probably had a double background, and which means it was two layers of gold with her name written in it. Um, you see, we had the leather on, uh, we had the multicolors, got the salt pepper vibe. Uh, and I was a very young lad. I, you know, I, I might've been five or six around this time. And uh, you couldn't tell me these women weren't gorgeous. Uh, the, hair, the hair would mimic, some people would liken it to, you know, sort of a crown, like the silhouette of a crown, if you will. Um, I remember what the, what that hair used to smell like. It was a spritz that they would use. Um, the um, the leather, the boots. There was actually a shop. Uh, it was called BBH, and it was owned by Kurt Pellerin. You would, uh, Juvenile raps about it in one of his songs. Leather goods from BBH. Um, you know that's where the hustlers was going to spend their money. And that's where you could go get the half leather, half suede sweater with the pants, the whole nine, and spend all your money at. Um, and I'm trying to paint this picture. So as I'm talking about these artists and these events and all that, this is what they look like. This is what they had on. This was the vibe. This is what it looked like to be at the top of it. That go these guys again. Um, you know, so, and as you can see, is that, no, he got on Air Max. I thought that was classics, but he got the gum sole on those, on those Air Max too. That, that tan sole I mentioned on the soldiers. What's the next slide we got? And that's Polo the Picture Man right there on the left. Um, you see the backdrop high roller. Um, he got the Fendi bag in his hand, got his gold chain on, dressed in black. Uh, he got the big, big daddy cane flat top. So, you know, this, this that's what I thought it was. Nah, nah, he looked just like him, right? He looked just like him. That's young, that's young Polo the Picture Man right there, man. Um, I, I, I know the brother on the right, I forgot his name though. But these were the times, this was the look. This was, you know, this was the youth. This is youth culture at the time. All right, so now we're at DJ Jubilee. And this is where things really got fun with the bounce stuff, when the dance became more defined, right? Because up until this point, you know, people would just do a uh, pee popping or uh, like they would call it pussy popping before it was called twerking, right? Um, used, to call, used to call it pee popping. Then, ju then Jubilee came, um, and drop the do the jubilee all and there was a song the cadence in the song was stop pause before he named every um every dance and uh, all the dances were named after people he knew they might have been at least 24 dances in this song and the cadence that you know, she, we're about to play it but the whole party literally did this whole song the song lasted about five six maybe seven minutes and we we ran it all the way to the end Every time you played it, there was no blending it in with another song. You did all the dances. And that's when things really, really, really became fun. It really became inclusive because his music didn't have like a, a, a gangster element, a street element. It was all about dancing. It was all about dancing. And I'm so glad we got the video so y'all can see. It keeps... Uh, it's buffering. Buffering though. Uh -oh. <laughs> 
the internet's great here. I don't know what the deal is. If it does, that will go back to it. But um, let's try. Another refresh movie. it at the top. Huh? Oh. Re refresh it at the top of me. No, no, right in the. Um, yeah, you could. Can I do this? Yeah, yeah, you good. You good. Oh man, please work. And Mercury is no longer in retrograde, so we ain't got no excuse. That's frustrating. Right, let me try another link. Yeah, and yeah, try that. Let me grab some water right quick while you do it. Okay, let's see if we can. All right, so we're gonna listen to DJ Jubilee first, and then we're gonna watch Stop Pause. So again, we're on the NOLA Hip Hop Archive website, and underneath each video, you can look down and you can see um, it's like a little time code that shows where things are. So let's do um, 9.05, his talking about stop pause. Hmm. Um, we, you know, what? Yes, yeah. put them in the local stores. 10 minutes later, they were calling back again. 500 tape going in like 30 minutes. But that's when it was hot. That's when it started to lose side. Yes, yes, yes. Been 20 years since Stop Pause took over and it was different. Now, out of Stop Pause, you're gonna learn another history. There was a new lady named Karen Cartello. She's not living anymore, but she was the one who interviewed me at a concert at Treme Center and she was asking me what type of news got to do. I said, I'm doing this dance type, make people high, call it bounce. Even though we had everlasting hitman saying bounce, baby, bounce, we never call it bounce yet. Never call it bounce. Nobody knows. We never call it bounce music yet. But when she interviewed me, I said more like bounce music, make you dance, make you move, represent your neighborhood, your school. And so when she did that, she put in the newspaper, biggest cup, bounce music, take over New Orleans. And that's when Jubilee bah, blew up some more. Kids is craving, kids want to know what are the dances. And, and that was my whole thing. When I went to go see Dave Shire and a whole bunch of artists, MC Dicknam, that Warren Mays gave a big concert for at the Municipal Auditorium for five dollars. He had all the rappers from the West Bank, downtown, Nightwall, everybody. He put in this one big concert, gave him five dollars. And I was very impressed with Dave Shire because they were doing the same thing that I was doing, making people dance. But they didn't have single dancers, they, didn't. they just had male dancing in the background of them. And so when that happened there, that's when I knew I had something special as far as the dance wise. And that's when, like I said, when I put all these, all these dancing on one song, it took off. It just had every kid, every school, high school, club, talent show, even the band wanted to do it. So when they did that, that's when Jubilee really hit the market. That's when, when, when Bounce was really created. We weren't saying Bounce, what Tucker was saying. We were just saying, you know, just that, that music. You know, so when that label came to, a lot of people don't know that every time I tell that story, they'd be surprised where it come from. And it came from the newspaper. That's how Bounce really got his word, Bounce music. Okay, so let's stop that there and then go back and see if we can make the video work. And there's not another option. That's like the only version that they have on the internet. Is it let me try it on my end, right? Can that happen? Or can we only do one uh we can only do one share screen at a time, but um I mean we can at least hear it, but we wanted you to see it as well. Oh yeah. Let's try one more time. So yeah, you could hear uh DJ Jubilee talk about, you know, where he says the term bounce came from and how it got popularized at that time, but more importantly, the role that he played in the evolution of this music and really strongly tying dance with the music itself. All right, we're just going to listen to it because YouTube hates us. So let's listen. Now, if this won't play, we should try it on my end. Okay, but um, yeah, here we go. Maybe I, I just didn't, maybe I just didn't wait long enough. I hate it so bad. It's a long song. Yeah, you see it's nine minutes, nine minutes and twelve seconds long. All break beats. The whole thing is just made out of break beats. Mm -hmm. Has anybody else had any problems with YouTube today?
Let, let me try it on my end. Pull it up on yours before we change the share screen. I don't think I could get out of it. Let yeah. me see. see if your YouTube works and then we'll shift over if it does. All right, I'm pulling it up. But I don't know why it would only not work on mine. That pause. Let's see if it's like, I'm just gonna put cats in. All right, wait, wait. It worked? I'm just saying if another uh, video will play of anything on YouTube. That's odd. What, that I typed in cats? No, I'm uh, looking on my end. Um, I think it may conflict with Zoom. No, we did it last week. We did? Yeah, we did a bunch of YouTubes last week. So I'm going to switch browsers since we can share screen and I'm going to try it in Safari because I'm in Chrome right now. Okay. And meanwhile, I'm going to do there it not on YouTube. And if this doesn't work, then we'll just have to move on and you guys will have to. Um, yeah. Check it out when we get off. On your own. Yeah. Definitely check it out though. See. Nine minute bounce song. Okay. Well, this one looks like it's going to work. Yay. Awesome. What? I say awesome. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, and strangely it has a picture of King Cake, but okay. The idea of that. This is how it should be done. I say Trent, stop talking at it. And by you believe this outfit. I want a white t shirt, some khaki pants, some all stars, get some money for the day. I see trees, stop jumping at it. If I do a leak his outfit, I want a white sheet shirt, some gaggy pants, some all stars, some gaggy pants. 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 Some gaggy
and it would be anywhere from five to 10 guys that would be in the crew and they would have these coordinated dance routines. Um, and they all, once the street fighters started, they all started taking um, the names of cartoon fighting crews. So after you had the, uh, the street fighters, you had the power rangers. After you had the power rangers, you had the exo squad. And then you had like the creepy crawlers. Then these girls came out and they were the little smurfs in the whole nine. And uh, it was just like a fun place, a fun thing for, you know, it, it was it was very much so child friendly, youth friendly. Um, so, you know, every, everything wasn't about killing, shooting, all that. It was about dancing and, you know, and girls and, you know, and the girls loving the dudes dancing. Um, Cause that, and that was funny because that was more popular for the guy groups to, uh, to dance and flex and do what they call it, the twerking and stuff because guys would shake their butt and all that. Um, I'm hoping, I'm praying this YouTube link works. So y'all can see the Street Fighters crew um, at McDonough 35 Talent Show. Um, they will get a DJ to mix all these beats together to create this performance so they could uh, do this performance. These guys were rehearsing in the backyards of each other's houses the whole nine to create this, uh, you know, these routines. And people would go crazy to, cr crazy about it because it was, you know, it was nothing we'd ever seen before. The style of dancing, as you heard Jubilee mention, uh, do the beanie weenie, that was a, a very popular dance where you would crank your arm back and forward. Um, and you'll see why we, we refer to the rest of it as flexing because it was a whole lot of, um, you know, body mechanics involved. Uh oh, don't do this to me. When we put this together this afternoon, it didn't do this. It surely didn't. It should, but we didn't try it on Zoom. It oh. fine last time. Anyway, um, let's see if I can maybe start it. Let's shift forward a little bit and like trick it into starting. Oh man, I was so happy earlier that we had this footage for y'all. Cause you, I mean, cause you would, you know, it's a talent show, so you're able to hear us cheering in the background. Uh, you know, the girls going crazy on specific parts. Uh, just the whole nine, it was. It was. Holly, what might work is if you pause it when it's loading like that. Maybe that'll let it catch up buffering. Yeah, but like my internet is really good. It shouldn't be doing that, but. Try, try to pause it. Pause now. Let's see if give it a couple seconds and see if that'll. <laughs> yeah, we, and they would coordinate the outfits. Uh, you know, khaki pants was a popular thing. We had a real preppy look going on at the time. Eastland shoes was the thing. You ain't really dancing your ballads. They cost too much for you to be bending your ballads up like that. Oh, oh man, this is like. Well, if it doesn't work, we will put together a thing for you and send everybody out um, the information on that. But yeah, that's a very strange situation. We'll just have to move forward, take our word for it, and we will send you some links. So let me come out of there. All right, so we're in 1993 right now. So moving into Mia. Um, Mia is just a powerhouse phenomenon. She still is. She's a chef. She's a memoir writer. She is a poet. She is a musician. She grew up masking as a Mardi Gras Indian. She has a very, very long lineage of musicians and artists, chefs in her family. Um, and she, I think we covered last week, she started really early with her friends, Manny Fresh um, and a few others in the seventh ward when she was still a tiny, tiny kid. And by 1993, she came out with her first major record. She'd had others before. And then that brings up an interesting point because when Nesby and I were talking about it today, um, I said, I thought it was 1993. And he was like, no, 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 no. It was before that. So if you want to talk a little bit about that and the difference in dates, depending on lit, what, what the formal documentation says versus what was actually happening. Yeah, so, you know, again, these... This music was made by young people who just got their hands on some equipment and got it to the airways as quick as they can with no type of uh, regard or even awareness of, of how to properly 
release music, right? Um, so <clears throat> my benchmark for the payback was I was in sixth grade, which means I was about 11 years old, which was 1992. And she performed this song at McMain's Auditorium. Um, and she had on the, you know, the windsuit, the whole nine. And it was playing on the radio, but I, you know, I guess she wasn't with a, a record label at the time. So, but now if you go look up the actual dates and when all this stuff came out, it's probably a year or two after the songs actually hit the streets and stuff like that. So, but it was, it was, it was a dope thing that she did and who she was because she had a, a you know, a presence lyrically, you know, she could go to toe to toe with any dude. She's actually between her and MC Light, she's like my favorite female rapper. Um, and I, I'll put them up against any, any man, any day. Um, and you know, a lot of the music, as you heard in, in Jubilee saying, I say, uh, uh, buy, buy me my outfit or it's all about, I'll buy you, you know, your outfit in, in exchange for a sexual favor. And you know, the music was filled with that. And she came and held it down for the ladies. Like, you know, I'm tired of, I'm tired of hearing y'all talk to us like that. I'm about to flip it on you, you know, and I'm gonna show you how I do these dudes. And that's when she came with the big payback. And that's what the payback was all about. Y'all ain't gonna keep shitting on the ladies on every record. Like I got to hold it down for us. And, and that's exactly what she did, you know. So I'm gonna be really smart and I changed it to Safari to see if it would do anything um, from Chrome. It didn't work for me when I did it. I hope it works for you. Your YouTube isn't working either? What is going on? Is it like a worldwide YouTube? Well, I think it's something to do with the Zoom. Uh, Janet Janet Gross said that she's having she's tried it to look it up too and it wasn't coming up on uh on her YouTube it wasn't coming up for her either so maybe well, I didn't actually click on anything but I'm gonna try just something and see if it does anything at all uh -uh. well we are somewhat YouTubeless so we will just try to make do without right now or another option is there are other um ways to hear things besides youtube so let's see if we can try to find something courtney do you have anything else to say about it while i try to find something um <clears throat> so she came out with that and i don't want to say she disappeared but she didn't have any records um to come out until the no limit thing really became a thing um and she uh like I, like I said, she, she really held it down for the ladies and she kept her presence around music by just being at the, the music store Peaches was where she worked. And again, the missing piece of having record stores or uh, the missing element to, you know, like the culture being developed. Louisiana. Sorry. That, that was the, you know, the, the breeding ground for, for opportunity to happen. That's where Wayne that baby Okay. All right. I didn't do that. All right, let's see if this actually works. If not, we'll just do well, it. I, actually, I got some play on my side from the from the explosion. So we could go back. You hurts, man. I came here tonight to sell the sport. Females are women and girls. Our bitches been hoes to all the men. Stop knocking weak ass lines. It's payback time. So what up, get up, get up, come on. referential bounce is an extremely referential genre um, because you hear 
allusions and references to everybody else's songs over and over and over and over again, right? And so she just mentioned, you know, six different songs at that particular time within her reframing and her uh, reframing the narrative and kind of, you know, shifting it to her own perspective. So let's go back. What are we going back to? So look, I got about half of a video ready to press play on the McDonald 35 explosion. Oh, you got it to work? Yeah, it, it isn't loaded up all the way, but it's enough for y'all to see. They got probably the first minute and a half of the routine. Okay, so, so I'll stop sharing and then you share. All right. So. Did you just leave it on long enough for it to load? Yeah, I just left it on this whole time. All right, so <clears throat> y'all can still hear me, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna try to skip past the introduction. And they all gonna come out in this very new edition like fashion. And uh could watch the full thing in y'all all the time but i just needed to you know bring y'all into that world uh and it, it, it was the do all be all for us what you said and then if you want to turn off your share screen i'll put it back on mine yeah let me see all right stop share got it okay and then i'll start share so again you know that just brings us back to um can everybody see the slide again now okay yeah it just brings us back to you know this music was everything all facets of life it was hilarious and fun and dangerous and violent and sad and happy and sexy and cool and uncool and all the things that happen in life it was everything um so you know it, it's just an entire slice of life in mm -hmm. all of its facets 100 percent mm -hmm. We went through Mia, we listened to a little bit about that, and let's just, just to so you get a taste for what she's actually like, let's listen to a little bit from her. My name is Mia Young. My stage name is Mia X. I grew up in New Orleans, downtown Singapore. My name had a between long and queer. Never on the wall. <laughs> Was a wonderful neighborhood because the elders took care of us. Everybody's everybody's child. Um, it was a neighborhood that was very rich in culture. Um, our grandparents told us stories and they shared all of their experiences with us. They taught us things, you know. So it was an awesome neighborhood. Good musicians, Dixie Cups. Our 
forever she's an extraordinary person to talk to and interview um, so when we're talking about women in rap and bounce it really irritates me because this happens with all genres we ghettoize women into their own little category so you know women musicians are over here and have their own little section and then everybody else is over here and I hate that and yet we did it um, just because we are, you know, pressed for time and we're trying to make a cohesive, linear uh, kind of historical narrative here. But just keep that in mind that I don't intend in any way for women to be their own little categories because women were visible on every level and involved in every level of rap and bounce in New Orleans. Um, so it, also in 1993, since that was where we're at right now, uh, Miss T, who some of you might know, she was 14 years old and she became the first female artist to sign to Cash Money Records. And she put out her first little record. It was called Chillin' on the Corner and then Woke One Morning. And I'm not going to bother trying to play the YouTube. We'll send you links. But let's hear just a little bit from Miss T uh, so you get a sense of her. I grew up in the Tremere tr tr in the Sixth Ward. Uh, they call it, it's like a historical old area. Uh, I stayed on St. Philip Street. My grandmother owned a house called the Big House, which I have a record company called Big House Entertainment. I named it after the house because it was, you know, family oriented or whatever. So uh, that's why I kind of grew up in the Sixth Ward. What kind of records were played in your house? What kind of music did you hear? My mom is a big Anita Baker fan. She loved Luther Vandross. Um, who else she played? A lot of old music I grew up listening to, and that really kind of got me into wanting to do music. Yeah, but a lot of Anita Baker, a lot of Luther Vandross, a lot of, uh, I forgot this old group name, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire. It was a lot of that going on. So my mom, my mom kind of influenced me in, you know, kind of getting into music because of the music she was playing around me. Did you play any instruments? Uh, no, but I have long fingers and everyone used to tell me when I was younger that I should play the piano. But I'm in college now, so, <laughs> and it's embarrassing to say I just started taking a piano class. So that's kind of cool. And Miss T is also a writer. She's got a memoir coming out pretty soon. So that should be really interesting. But this is her album cover for that first album, which is really fun to see. Yeah, that, she had a, her, her, her album was pretty damn good. It, and, and it's funny, like you were saying, how we would separate the men from the women, but the women always brought another element. And the dope thing about Miss T was that she had a melody. She would harmonize. She would still be rapping, but she would harmonize a lot. And uh, and it was like the perfect world between like a, a rapper, like she would say, Anita Baker. You got that feel. It was gangster, but it was still almost like, uh, you know, Betty Wright was in the room, you know? So her, her music was hard, but it was also like warm and super chill. So Miss T is a, is a legend for sure. 
And like I said, you know, there were tons of them. Ghetto Twins, there were some early female DJs, uh, Cheeky Black, who many of us might know. Wait, Cheeky Black was a DJ? No, no, no. I was saying oh. there were a few early female DJs, too. All right, you about to put me on something. <laughs> no. Um, but there were countless women integrally involved in the rap and bounce scene. They were facilitators, behind the scenes influencers, dancers, vocalists, and you can't underestimate the impact and influence that they had, as well as being practitioners of the music. 100%. So moving into the year 1994, which Courtney talked about a little bit before, it's a pivotal year in New Orleans history in general, but it's specifically in New Orleans music history. Um, that's when you get into the rivalry between Partners in Crime and UNLV, which is how we started the class off, talking about that. Um, and then you get the two big Partners in Crime mega hits that came out of that year. One was Let the Good Times Roll, and you start to hear the music sounding, uh, begin to sound a little bit more commercial, a little bit more poppy, rhythm and blues. Yeah. And Pump the Party, which was the other big anthem of that year. So let's cross your fingers and see... Nope. Well, at least they're telling us that it's not going to work now. Let's try the other one. Nope. All right. Well, we give up on YouTube tonight. And and that, that's a jamming ass record, right? Pump the Party. Whoo, man. It really did just that. It really did just that. This was, when, this, this was when you would actually go home like soaking wet from going out. Now we, we kind of be cool. We, we too cool nowadays, you know. But we, you that went is, up, you back. That anymore. So, right. Um, so let's listen to them talking about Pump the Party. Um, so ten, at 1040. So let's start that. By this time, you know, but he was trying to pursue his college career. And then when me and uh, that was in high school with us, we still hang together to the day. Like, just like, yeah. Well, still friends, still cool always. So it must have been so quick because you all played Jazz Fest early. I mean, wasn't it like 94, 95 that you played Jazz Fest for the first time? No, that was like, it was a little after that. Probably about like 97 around that yeah. time. Yeah, 97. But still, you know, just in the course of a few years, I mean, most people, you know, yeah. have a long career before they get to Jazz Fest. We, we made a song that. We, we, we made we created a song called Pump the Party that was so big in this market to where it was like, you know, it's like to, still to the day, you know, you're gonna hear that wet this part. I mean, it, it get it, it still get played, like, you know what I'm saying? It's a classic song and it's it's New Orleans, like and a lot of people like it. Some people I say, you know partners of crime, they like older people. They're like, oh, um, you don't know that little group. I ain't that's all that the hip hop stuff. You say, and I say, you know, pump the pump the party, oh, that's my song. Yeah. Hold up. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know who I am, like, you know what I'm saying? So as usually like I have if I ask anybody, do you know this, they at least know that song, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So it was, big, it was a big college song. It was an anthem of bounce music, too. They called it the anthem, the bounce anthem, you know? But uh, yeah, we covered a lot of ground <laughs> and then a lot of hard work. I mean, when we, when we look back at it, knowing that we uh, when we first came in the game, nobody knew us and we had to pretty much go work those, you know, back country towns and, you know what I mean? Get our name known. We, we really went out there and did it. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a blessing to say that uh, we've been in the game 19, 19 years, years, and we're still relevant. You know what I mean? One of the only original groups from back then. I mean, we are the only group that still remain relevant. Every year we drop the music and we're still, you know what I mean? <clears throat> we're still building that family. Still got kids, <laughs> five, three, yeah. two years old. Generations of people. I'm so attracted, you know what I'm saying? Still have little kids yeah. saying it's Think about it. When we came out in 94. 93, really. We came out in 93. We were a household name in 93. Think about the grandmothers that listened to us back then. That the, Well, the people that listened to us, that's grandmothers and grandfathers now. Think about their kids that they had that grew up with us. And think about their kids. You know what I mean? I have, I have three kids in college right now. You know what I'm saying? They know all of my music. Even kids that's younger than them, kids, you know, ninth graders, they know my music. So it's like generations, there's so many generations. And I believe in the end, that's what's gonna, you know what I mean? That's what's gonna make us stand stronger than ever, like because of so many generations of people that, that knew the music, especially being here home base and 
you know, doing it the hardest markets to make it in. Yeah. So I know we're skipping back and forth um, in time here, but can you tell us about um, how Big Boy came about, how all well that started, and then we'll skip forward that cash money and your LV? Big, Big Boy, uh, Big Boy came along. Um, I was doing the gong shows, and then they had a guy named Sporty T that was uh, he keeps from How to Go too. Part so, of the Ninja Crew. Yeah, Ninja Crew. So he was more like in the thing, and I was in it, but I was bringing these high school kids. That was loving me. I had a girlfriend that went to this popular school, McDonald 35, and all these graduates, graduates or whatever, would come to this this spot. So when I get on the mic, they was like cheering for me like mad crazy. I used to win this dong show every time. So I was working, I was a cashier, and he uh, came to my job, it was a job called Swag, I was a cashier. He comes up to my job, he's like, hey, but you was the guy that be winning that, that um, them gong shows. Like, I'm like, yeah. He was like, man, you about to start a record label, and I want to um, I wanna bring you, you know, on. So I'm like, cool. So he came back to me, he said, what time you get off? I told him, he came back and got me, you know, and then he brought me to the guy Chuck. I rapped for the guy Chuck. The guy Chuck said, he's whack. Like, he's the wackest rapper I've ever heard. Get him on my face. Don't ever bring him around again. Cool, cool. So I'm like, all right. Kind of was mad about that. But then, like I said, at the gong shows that was going on in this club, Big East. Yeah. So Sporty T said, look, man, he don't know the power y'all got. I want y'all to rap at the at the gong show. And, you know, like, it's because they had Black Minutes and Sporty T was going to be, that was that was Big Boy Records. And he was like, I'm going to let y'all open up for us. So when we come on and we rock it. Chuck was like, hey, man, <laughs> he's coming to my office Monday, you know what I'm saying? Ooh. And that's like, like I said, we didn't really go to labels. Label came to us, like, and that's how that came. Big boy was like, look, boy. Really, the cash money thing came before that, too, because with us, uh, we're in the gong shows, cash money, we had, uh, it started the cash money yeah, Friday. cash money Friday, so we won the gong show that Friday, and cash money wanted to sign us to the deal. So uh, we just decided not to go that way, and right after that, Big Boy had presented us with the opportunity to sign with All right, so yeah, again, that's echoing everything that Courtney was telling us at the beginning about, you know, the early days of Big Boy and about the rivalries driving the music. So moving forward, so 1994, one of the main reasons that it was an incredibly pivotal year in New Orleans history is because it was named the murder capital of the country, right? So the so-called authenticity of all things hood or ghetto in New Orleans has long been emphasized by travel writers, journalists, writers of fiction, and over time that's really blended with ideas about danger and violence in this kind of racialized sort of way that we be began to talk about last week. There are endless illusions if you go back and look at tra travel writing, uh, journalists writing at the time, endless illusions and quotes about New Orleans being the blackest city in America, and that mixes with these racist and race-based fears to create an extreme sensationalism surrounding violence in New Orleans. It is true, however, that since the earliest days of New Orleans founding over 300 years ago, New Orleans has been a dangerous city, and there's a lot of documentation about that. So keeping that in mind, then, The drug and housing epidemics of the 80s and early 90s in New Orleans, however, along with the economic hardships caused by the fallout of the oil industry and increasing police and city corruption scandals, created a perfect storm that resulted in the record-breaking year of 1994 when 421 homicides first earned New Orleans its murder capital moniker. On October 30th, 1994, 60 Minutes aired a national segment on CBS investigating New Orleans shocking violence, causing New Orleans plaguing crime rate to be at the center stage in the national press. So from then on, both outsiders and insiders used references to the murder capital for differing reasons. Much of this authenticity, authenticity is centered around the housing projects, and you can see the musical output begin to reflect this. So before we move on, uh, Nesby, I wanted to talk about the role of the housing projects in the music. So can we start on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, every city, major city has its housing projects and um, they all have an identity attached to it. Um, and as I mentioned last week, uh, this city was divided into wards, which were voting districts, um, but people still rep them as, um, as they, kind of grouped together in the neighborhoods. And, and some projects were bigger than others. Uh, 
the Third Ward alone had the Calio project, the Magnolia project, as well as the Melpamine project. Uh, I believe the Calio was one of the bigger ones, but I think the Desire project and the Ninth Ward was the biggest. Um, it was sort of territorial. Um, you had to be uh, somewhat of a gifted person of the streets to be able to move from one project to another and have the relationships. Uh, you know, maybe you have family in, in one project and, and the other. Um, all, all the projects had, they were known for different things. Uh oh, you're frozen again. I'll continue while he's frozen. So all the housing projects were known for different things. So, um, you know, and there are tons and tons. Oh, there you are back again. I'm back. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so yeah, they were all known for different things. Uh, for one, what was available or what was going on in, in that, uh, in that area, like St. Thomas was, you know, a place where you could get heroin and, um, uh, you know, the Magnolia had a personality where people were very, uh, uh, colorful and uh, you know they were all about stunting real hard um, much like in New York Harlem is, is where the flashy guys were right and um, you know the Calio is a little more rough around the edges um, then there was the the Lafitte project which is in Treme um, and that was divided into what they call the wild side and the real side I used to cut hair around there on Galvis and uh, Orleans the wild side um, was the guys that will kill you and the real side was the guys that were still down to fight you, you know. Um, what else? Moving towards, because next to that was the Iberville. The Iberville was, what, what was it called? Storyville? Storyville. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Iberville is where Storyville was. When I, that was, you know, a lot of what the jazz uh, evolved. Where Louis Armstrong is from. Yep. And then, uh, then you move over to the Ninth Ward, and you have the Desire in the Florida. The Florida is smaller, but the Desire is, is, is stupid big. It's one of the bigger ones, um, bigger projects, biggest projects, and it had a, a Black Panther presence um, in uh, the '60s, in the early '70s. There was actually, and y'all can look this up on YouTube, a big uh, police standoff with the Black Panthers um, in uh, in the Desire Project, um, and those those people were very militant. Uh, you know, um, and, and that personality carried over into the, the, the new generation, if you will. But um, they all had their own personalities, their own quirks. They were all known for different things. And it was something to call out, you know, your project. And being from there came with a lot of street credibility, um, which was, a, you know, a good thing and a bad thing, you know, because um, depending on where you were, you know, because you, you'd be somewhere and, you know, the Calio from you'll be from the Calio and it'll be okay to be around this group, but then you fool around and run into some people from the Magnolia, and then you got a bad situation. Um, so there were rivals, uh, and around the time when uh, I believe the, the start of gentrification, I remember I forget what project they tore down, but they took the people from this project and moved them. To another part of town near another project. I think they took the St. Thomas and moved them by the St. Bernard, which started an all out war or something like that. Um, there's so much that could be said about the projects, but um, a lot of what we see in the music, uh, hearing the music, comes from those places. Uh, the Magnolia probably is the most popular from, from Juvenile and Soldier Slum. Um, Magnolia Shorty was from there. Um, you know, it, it spawns so much talent because just like in New York, you know, you got all those people living on top of each other. Um, there was a whole lot of styles mixing, a lot of influence, the whole nine. So um, and it goes back for, you know, many years. We're not just talking about rap and bounce. We're talking about rhythm and blues. We're talking about jazz. We're talking about everything. Well, you know, 1940s, 1950s on. Um, like the Nevels, the Nevels and the Calio project, you know, I mean, there was a, a very strong connection there. Um, but what you have happening right around 94 is, you know, this kind of murder capital thing kind of occurring at the same time that cash money begins to become a much bigger name. And then right after that, No Limit becomes a much bigger thing. And then over the course of the next three or four years, then Cash Money becomes aligned with the Magnolia Project and No Limit becomes aligned with the Calio Project. 
And then you have uh, kind of an awareness, a national and international awareness of these two housing projects as aligned with these massive uh, recording labels that are internationally known, which is a really, really fascinating dynamic. And still today, we don't have YouTube, but I put this on uh, because still today, what you have is artists from all around the country coming to New Orleans and shooting videos um, to try to align themselves with New Orleans housing projects through credibility. So Rick Ross did that really famously with his Hold Me Aback video in 2013. So a lot of outsider artists still come to New Orleans to try to align themselves with that kind of credibility, which is which is an interesting dynamic. So this is a heavily YouTube oriented discussion. So we might leave this until next week because we really want you to hear about it. Um, because we go into Partners in Crime, before we move forward, we go into Partners in Crime in a song called New Orleans Block Party, which incorporates Mardi Gras Indian chants um, and a whole bunch of stuff. So <clears throat> without YouTube, why don't we open it up to a little bit more of a discussion? And Courtney, do you want to, um, let's, if do you want to talk more about dance or where do you want to start? And then we can focus, I'll turn this off and we can go to gallery view and then maybe do a little discussion. We talk about dance in reference to what? Does it a black party or just overall? In general, if you want to kind of wrap that up and then we can see where the discussion takes us. Um, as far as the dance thing, and it's funny cause like the video I showed y'all was in 96, right? So. 94 was the peak of it. And I don't think this was a conscious effort on our part, but with 94 being so wild, we really kind of flowed over into a dance thing. You know, it's kind of like the tipping point, right? Everything kind of went so far this way, we took it back that way. Um, and then as time passed, that kind of tapered off um, as you roll into the late nineties. And then it became more about uh, kind of mimicking the success that you would see on a national level of the bad boys and the rough riders and the songs and so forth. So this dance era that existed, it had about a good strong four or five year run, if that. Um, and it was a beautiful time, like I said, but uh, but it, it, it did eventually taper off and there were no more crews and stuff like that. And then you start to see like, you know, more labels popping up and just everybody just wanted to rap at this point. Um, but I, I, we did. We I just saw the uh, the slide for the Indo Black Party. We about to flow into that. No, we're not going to do that tonight because it we, ha we need lots of YouTube. So we're just doing this. Right, 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 right. cool, cool, We've cool. given up on YouTube for the evening. We're moving right. on. Just making sure. But yeah, but uh, so now you know dance dance is kind of all over the place now. Now it's kind of like a, a do what you want, and the women really got that now, especially where where bounce is now. Uh, it's kind of all about ass shaking now. And, and they really cut up in all of the songs. There's so many uh, new bounce rappers now, like uh, Treaty and uh, there's a few other ones. You can look up their stuff. There, there's a club, when there was clubs, <laughs> uh, uh, Tasty Tuesdays, it was at Club Live on um, Tulane Avenue. Tasty Tuesdays, it was a bounce night. You could literally go in there for whenever the club opened, 10 o'clock, and until the last person go home at three, four in the morning, it's literally ass shaking all night. Um, so it's funny to see where it evolved to. Uh, it's not coordinated anymore. It's sort of like just this, this whole freestyle thing. Um, and, and, and it's also kind of sectioned off. It's not general like it used to be anymore. It's his own little subgenre, it's his own lane, so on and so forth. Um, Early on, that's a good point, um, because early on, you know, you had the lines between rap and bounce being super blurry, yep. and you had storytelling in bounce, right? So people were telling full-on stories. And then when you got, we'll cover this again, probably in the last class, but then when you get to, you know, the 2010s-ish, um, 2005, 2010, 2015, then you have bounce really changing into this really, really, really fast RPM super repetitive it's all about ass shaking and the stories get left behind there are no stories you know so it's mostly just repeating short phrases and the sound of the music has really greatly changed but fifth ward weeby was one of the people who kind of whatever year that what was year that was that which one let me find out 
Let me find out was, cause me and him, we dropped a single that same year. We were featured in GQ. That was roughly 2014. Okay, so somewhere around there, um, Fifth Word Weeby came out with the song, Let Me Find Out, some of you might know. And that's kind of credited with the first bounce song to bring back storytelling. Because for so long, for about a decade, it was moving toward the super fast, repetitive stuff. And then he kind of created a song that was funny, that was all, that brought back the you know era of storytelling. Right. And, and unfortunately, we lost him, uh, what, last year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, it was last year. No, it was the top of this year, wasn't it? No. You sure? Because most people were suspecting it was like COVID before COVID hit or something like that. Um, but yeah, he was definitely a legend. He like I, That was him. He was the first person in line on the Street Fighters video. Um, he was the drum major at his high school. He was the life of the party. He was the pulse of you know the culture at that time. Um, in it because after these uh, these talent shows that would be after parties um, at St. Mark's over there on Rampart and stuff, or at the Autocrat on St. Bernard, which is all roughly in the same area. Uh, but Fifth Wall Weeby was a classic guy, and he was able to like kind of like take a moment in. Uh, in New Orleans, you know, rap history, bounce history, whatever you want to call it, and carry it all the way up until his death. Um, and, it, and he was always able to make it relevant. He made it stick. He made it colorful. He made it comical. Um, and he made it relatable for everybody. He became a phenomenal personality in the community down here. I can't say enough about him. And um, he, my personal relationship with him was every time I would see him, he would always tell me how proud of me he was. And I was like, what did I do? <laughs> but, he, but he had this infectious, like motivating spirit about him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so he was a beautiful guy. Um, very, he, I, you could almost say like he was the fast dominoes of bounce. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I can't say enough about February Weeby. I'm glad you brought him up. So if y'all ever get time, cause he had more singles than Let Me Find Out. Um, there was a time before that in the early 2000s where he had a, a, quite a few singles. Um, Loving You, I Really Want You, um, st stuff I still play when I DJ because they really rock the clubs. He, he, he was a great songwriter. And it was, you know, it was a blessing that he had such a huge hit before he died too, that he yeah. was so well into his, into his career. Yeah, because not only did he have that hit that he remixed with Juvenile and Snoop, then you fast forward to when Drake dropped this album and Drake, uh, he was actually brought in by Cortez because they're actually from the same neighborhood. Cortez is originally from the Fifth Ward. And um, when Drake reached out to Cortez, it was like, man, I'm trying to create this sound. And you know, what could you, who could you send me that could really help me tie it all together? And he immediately called Fifth Ward Weeby and um, Black and Mile, the producer, and got them involved with the, uh, Nice for what? Um, and then Black and Mild did the uh, what's the what's the other one? The one that went really big. I forget the name of it. But right before he died, he had literally had a worldwide hit on his hands. Yep. So we wanted to open up to any questions or comments or discussion points or anything. We've got about um, twenty five minutes left. I have one. Yeah. Uh, early on. Partners in Crime were talking about playing Jazz Fest in like uh, 97. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. How did, how did Jazz Fest incorpor start incorporating, I mean, was it, are they, were they the first or were they just, were they part of, you know, Jazz Fest had kind of recognized that earlier on, but late, how did, uh, so because bounce, I mean, Big Frida's out there and has, has like some of the biggest crowds of the year now, right. every single year. So how did that happen? So, so first, sorry, and I'll just do this and then you go ahead. But right. so in the first um, last week, we talked about how like something sometime around 2010, things started to shift. The storm had a lot to do with it because you had changing demographics in the city. There were a lot of complicated reasons for it, but around the early 2010s, things started to change and you started to see a huge shift in programming and the local festivals. So French Quarter Fest was a little bit late to the game, but you had Jazz Fest and a lot of the smaller festivals starting to incorporate rap and bounce artists into their lineups. 
early on that did not happen. So, you know, in the late 90s, we're talking about, so Partners in Crime said they, they thought it was 1997 when they played Jazz Fest. The mm-hmm. following year was when Juvenile put out his biggest record to date, you know, internationally famous um, 400 Degrees. And, um, and so it was a, this really, really strange bifurcation that was happening. But they were, if not the first, they were one of the first. Well, really so, did, so did Juvenile play in 1998 with that huge hit? Not I, I don't think, he, yeah, he kind of skipped over that at that point. They were kind of out of here. Uh, once they took off, they were doing like like real tours, like them and Rough Riders. So it was like Juvenile and DMX and stuff like that. But yeah. four partners in crime went up. You know, like I was saying earlier in the beginning of the, uh, the lecture, uh, Mystical was one of the first people to have like really- I saw stuff. him in a one. Yeah. So what before before Partners of Crime in the nineties when he uh-huh. dropped, when he dropped the single um not here go uh, y'all ain't ready yet um that was produced by Precise who's still on Big Boy and I think they had the jive thing going he performed on the Congo Square stage okay um, so that might have been because I, I I went to go see him we were all excited to go see him uh he was like my he was my best friend's uh, favorite rapper. Um, and he would do this this breakdown thing in the middle of his performance where he pretended to be Michael Jackson, rip his shirt off, put like a fake glitter sock on his hand or something like that. But uh, I can say Mystical definitely performed there before they did in, in maybe 94, 95 or something like that. But you wouldn't have necessarily called Mystical a bounce artist, right? He was just absolutely. Like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. But uh, but you know, it was. It's interesting because when they brought that up, that obviously was important to them that they got to play Jazz Fest in '97. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they had plenty of hits for them to be there at that time, if not earlier. So yeah. So they. So the Jazz Fest, you know, originally, you know, it's like a, a folk based fest, right? But you know, they're kind of getting with the times now because you know you you got to start merging in the new people, right? The new sound, especially if you're talking about a Congo Square stage, the programming for that stage, you know, you're not gonna get Bobby McFerrin forever, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's what I'm getting at is it's still a big deal to perform at Jazz Fest, even with as many people as made it on stage. I performed there twice, and it, you know, the the, the treatment, the stage itself, being on that big screen to make it there at any level. Is still a big thing, whether it's ninety four or two thousand twenty four. You know that's a that's a, a hell of a, a you know achievement. You know. Yeah. And like I, we were saying, the lines between rap and bounce are super blurry to most people, but to some artists, there was a huge difference. So probably next week when we get into mystical, I'll play part of my interview with him where he talks about how he used to fight people if they called him a bounce artist. He was really? not artist he was a rapper he don't call me a bounce artist and um so he would be somebody who i self-identifies as a rapper and if anybody called him a bounce artist it'd be problems so (laughs) so that would make sense that jazz fest would program a rapper before they would program a local bounce artist right yeah thank you yeah comments questions thoughts We'll just keep talking if you. Oh want. wait, one second. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm live. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm enjoying the course so far. Uh, I'm originally from New Orleans, however, uh, I've been maybe some years re- removed uh, in the middle. I would say from '90 until 2015. Okay. I was either in the military or overseas. Right. So uh, I grew up in New Orleans East. I'm talking about prior. Pre nineties, New Orleans. Yeah, that, that was the hey, that was the do all be all. Correct. Yeah. yeah, we had shopping malls out here. Not anymore, more, yeah. but this, these were the suburbs out here. Not anymore oh. since Hurricane Katrina and a lot of the displaced families uh, from in town were merged out here. So um, that was the shift that happened in this area. But anyway, uh, Ju- no uh, jubilee. I went to school while he was at Grambling. I was at Grambling as well. So he is a college graduate. Um, and at the time when he released his uh, the Jubilee All, do the, do the Jubilee All. Yeah, okay. the stop, pause, yeah. stop, pause, okay. 
when he released that, I was just graduating from Grambling and I was already in the military. Didn't know how popular it had gotten until I was in Korea. So yes, yes, until I was in Korea and uh, I was like, oh wow, they are playing it in the clubs, military clubs in Korea. So that's just how popular it had gotten because of the um, United States being so much abroad and having the music played overseas. So that's how some t some of the music gets uh, played overseas. I didn't know about, uh, um, who was it, Master P until someone was saying about it, about it in Osan Air Base, Korea. So that's how it gets proliferated overseas and carried out to uh, other countries. Okay. So I applaud what you guys are doing. This is the first. This is the first uh, hip hop class, right? The first bounce class that's been done. Holly could speak better. Speak better to that. Uh, it's yeah. the first one through the Cabildo, yeah. yeah. Okay, through the Cabildo. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm enjoying it so far. I'm a I'm a carriage driver, so I'm a tour guide. And a lot of what I've taken more of the courses that have been given online and uh, much of the content I'm going to use on my tours. So I appreciate classes like this. All right. Thank you all right. for having it. Yeah. It's all and you're going to. Uh, I, I go by KJ. K, uh, Bang Charmer was like a DJ name I had overseas. Okay. I was da dibbling, dabbling with, uh, with DJing, but it was mostly EDM music overseas. Yeah. Not uh, now. I did have a night where I, it was during Carnival time, and Carnival in Europe is celebrated differently than we celebrate it in New Orleans. So I was just trying to give them a feel of how we celebrate it, and wasn't playing much bounce music, but more pop, New Orleans pop, rap music that they were used to, and kind of uh, you know threw some, a little bit of bounce in, but not too much. Mm. You know, because sometimes when DJing, you have to look at the human behavior on the floor yeah, yeah, yeah. and what they're vibing to at yeah. that time. But I'm enjoying this course. Absolutely. I go by KJ. Uh, my name is Kevin Joseph. Uh, right. But Bang Charmer is just a moniker that I use, like online and whatnot. All right. Makes sense. All right. Yeah. And it, he brought up a really interesting point, which is, you know, if you go overseas, these artists are to so many people, um, Europeans, Africans, lots of people, especially in Europe, East Asia, probably too, like you were saying, um, these people are, you know, superstars, just as they are in America, right. of course, but even more so, even more so. Um, the music travels. Um, New Orleans music has a beloved presence in the international scene. Yeah, I learned that through uh, reading a lot of biographies from Quincy mm -hmm. Jones, Miles Davis, the whole nine, even in Malcolm X, um, the way they referenced New Orleans was all, they always took a moment to expound on um, whomever they talking about at the time, whether it was a musician. I remember Malcolm X talk about a guy that kept a speakeasy kitchen, um, mm -hmm. who was from New Orleans that you could get jambalaya at five in the morning in Harlem, you know, yes. it would always say something special about uh, people from New Orleans. So um, I, that's crazy to me, but it, it, and I didn't realize it until I actually started traveling and and people would automatically give me um, this perceived power or credit for whatever it is I'm doing. Oh, you're from mm -hmm. New Orleans? It was automatically, so, you know, so tell me about it, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a birthright, it's a birthright. That's right. Yeah. And you, know, you find that over time, like we were talking about with the murder capital nonsense and the travel writers, they've done this since the 1700s in New Orleans. You know, the way people talk about New Orleans is always extreme, good for good or bad. It's nobody ever just says like, oh, New Orleans, yeah. You know, it's always something very good or very bad or very interesting. You know, it's always something sensationalized just a little bit. Right, got it. Questions or comments? Who said that? I said, what about the rest of y'all? Angel, are you in New Orleans? Hi, yeah, I'm in New Orleans. Um, 
I'm an uh, artist and art teacher here. I'm originally from Baton Rouge. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm actually um, thinking about doing a project around um, hip hop artists in New Orleans. So that's why I was interested in taking the class. Um, and it's crazy because I was like, Facebook must be stalking me because I was like Googling stuff. And then this class like popped up on my news feed and I was like, who's reading my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Facebook um, is definitely that's, talking. It's talking <laughs> yeah, so that's how I ended up finding a, um, finding out about it and joining. Okay, where do you teach art? I'm teaching at um, Matters in Metairie. Okay. Um, Rudolph Matters is, um, I'm teaching talented art now. I was in Arlene's Parish for like the last four years um, at Capto. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Hey, we're good. Thank you. So Jan and Tamara, y'all gonna y'all gonna stay hidden forever. But I like to hear from you guys, and we brought you to the class. Amanda, do you have anything to say? So I don't have any questions, but I would echo what KJ said just about just loving it so far. And I like my background is more in the the brass band scene. I'm a trombone player. And that's what brought me to New Orleans is just to like learn that craft. And so this for me is something I'm interested in, but just don't have a lot of, like, I don't know the rep, I don't know the artists. And so this is just like drinking from a fire hose and I love it. So thank you. I just, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to just listen more and, and just go out and see some of these, these dudes live. Like as we get into the, the more recent stuff, I'm excited to go and experience it more. Right. So what so you could do. So Janet just chatted and said, not presentable, but very much enjoying this. Okay. I, well, I understand. <laughs> I understand. But I was going to say, uh, Amanda, and to everyone, if you go to any one of these older uh, New Orleans links on YouTube, it'll, it'll run a chain of other songs from the era. Sweet. So but if you put in UNLV or if you put in Jubilee, or Dolomite or any of these artists that we're naming, if y'all jotting them down and it'll run you through it. And literally listening to it is like literally being back in club rumors or something from the early nineties. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so you could get lost in it actually. Yeah, I'm driving back down from Denver weekend after next and it's like a two day drive. So I like, I'm just gonna plug it in and see what, see yeah. what plays. <laughs> Make for a fun drive. And I was talking to to Jason about it, um, seeing if we can maybe put together a Spotify list for all y'all. Uh, they're easy to find, but we might be able to curate something more specifically for you. That'd be amazing. Yeah, especially if we could put it uh, in chronological order, and then that way you could see how the style evolved and the recordings got better, you know, the whole night. That's one of my favorite things when I listen to uh, all of the Cash Money stuff. There's a part. There's a part when there's about a series of three or four albums that come out, and it's like BG's album, um, then uh, no, the BG's the group, and then then BG's album, then Juvenile album, then BG album. It was like the, BG's. If y'all don't know the Baby Gangsters, that was Lil Wayne's first little group. Well, it was uh, it was him and BG, but he went by, yeah, but he went by Doogie at the time. Yeah. And that was produced by Don B, who I told you was Dave Bartholomew's son. Dave Bartholomew is the famous rap, rhythm and blues producer. Right. Um, but building off of what KJ was talking about, so right before COVID started, there was, you know, we still haven't really gotten it together in terms of a cultural tour, cultural historical tour of, of jazz or New Orleans rhythm and blues. There's very little, there's a bunch of initiatives and some people doing it, but there's not one cohesive thing. So if I was a tourist and coming to look for like a driving tour of important cultural places in New Orleans, it's hard to find that information in one place, um, even though a lot of people are involved in that. But right before COVID, there was a big initiative to do a driving tour of New Orleans rap and bounce. Um, and, you know, an audio map and all of that. There were people who were trying to get a statue of Lil Wayne put up in Hollygrove um, because, you know, especially all of us are interested, but especially Europeans come here 
and they want to see all this. They want to know exactly where this stuff happened. Um, and you know, what's really interesting is, I think we talked about this in the first class, after Katrina, they tore all the housing projects down. They are no more. There's something different. And they changed all the names. So the Magnolia Project that had this larger than life presence on the New Orleans music scene is now Harmony Oaks. Oaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, the Iberville is gone entirely, um, the Calliope is gone, you know, so you have all these different things either renamed or gone forever. And so there's not really that much to see in terms of cultural landmarks that are still there post Katrina, but it's still so important to have that kind of infrastructure in place. Um, you know, not even leaving the tourists out of it, it's so important for our own citizens to understand this history and know where all this took place. So, yeah, that was that was kind of in the works before COVID. I have no idea. The world is different now. So we will see. There's um there's a tour company, it's a black owned tour company called Second Line Tours. They do a lot of uh, um, trips through the neighborhood. They come through Holly Grove all the time, bring people to the uh, the Lil Wayne mural on Olive Street. Uh, so that's the closest I've seen to it. But we definitely need like more placards up and stuff like that. 100%, 100%. And Tamara says, loving this, I'm learning so much. I've been associated with the State Museum and the Friends of the Cabildo for a long time. Would love to see an exhibition. We would too, Tamara, we absolutely would. Um, there are lots of issues associated with that. Lots of people have tried. Um, I was involved in a lot of um, kind of talks about doing something like that, whether it be a brick and mortar museum. One of them got pretty far and then fell apart. It's kind of happened over and over and over again. And then Amistad Research Center, you know, where my archive is, they were talking about having a space where they would start to bring in actual artifacts. Um, and that fell through because, you know, it's so hard to find funding for that kind of thing now. Um, so it's something that I think everybody has lots of interest in, but it hasn't really come to fruition yet. And especially now that things are difficult. The other issue is since Katrina, all of the ephemera is hard to find. So a lot of this stuff is just gone. Um, pictures, records, um, shoes, you know, everything. Um, so it's really, it creates, it makes things more difficult. And that, that, that's what gives so much value to uh, Polo, the picture man, and the archive that he was able to preserve. Uh, that makes that makes it worth so much more because all this stuff is pretty much gone. And yes, I am uh, good friends with Greg, and I am on the board of the New Orleans Jazz Museum, and I'm on the board of their new big exhibit that they have coming up. So yeah, he knows all about my stuff, and we've talked. We've, I don't think we've talked specifically about this, but I was involved in the curation of a couple of their exhibits um, in the past. And he's really, really interested and always receptive to doing anything like that. It's just right place, right time, right funding, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It needs to be in the Cabildo. There you uh, go. That's I, what I, I haven't been there since like elementary school field trip. No, seriously, that's where it should go. You should go to the Cabildo. That would be awesome. <laughs> We should talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask one more question. Um, uh, I'm going back. I, I took a ton of notes and then I think a lot of my questions are going to come up next week because they're related to stuff that we had talked about that will be on there next week. Miss T talked about the influences that her mother played to her to, to listen to music. And it was Anita Baker and Luther Vandross. Now that's the complete opposite of the music she created in the sense that she, it was much more, it's different. It's very different uh, style of music that she grew up on that she obviously liked still, but then she did a different style of music. Um, can you talk about kind of other influences that were, you know, maybe for you, or you think there were other common influences of people that were rappers or eventually bouncers? Well, I, I beg to differ about yeah, I T. I disagree because Miss T, uh, I think Courtney said before, she had such a, her, it, with her singing, she yeah. has smooth vocal delivery. Yeah, and maybe you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like an like a rhythm and blues crooner, you know. Yeah, she she's a crooner. That's a good word for her because she wasn't like a traditional. She wasn't like a you know. She's not Whitney Houston, right? But what she gave was was raw, more like a blues musician. You know what I'm saying? Like it's an untrained voice. Sometimes it was probably wasn't even in a real true key, right? But it sounds good on the bed of music, and I, I guarantee you, if she 
if she'd have been backed by a band, you'd have been like, oh yeah, I hit it, I need a bigger, right? But she was she was doing this over bounce beats. So, yeah. so it was really the better music that made had you fooled. But uh, she is every bit of the school of Anita Baker, in my opinion. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, that, now that you way you say it, that makes much more sense. I just, I mean, I just caught me off guard, and maybe I wasn't. Uh, I, I just wrote it down real quickly. Maybe I, wasn't, I didn't hear the, res- the complete response. But all I, of us, it. all of us were, um, you know, all of us were influenced by the music in our household. That's why you would hear a lot of the samples that you would hear. You know, um, it was it was it was Shaw Day samples. Um, the, um, Parties of Crime got let the good times roll. That's a uh, Earth Wind and Fire sample. Um, DJ yeah, Jimmy. And Earth Wind and Fire too. Yeah, which was very important. <laughs> right. So DJ Jimmy, uh, we're gonna start this thing off right. We got such and such in the house tonight. That's that's an old uh chant from the 70s. I forget what record it was from. Um, you know, I can say my personal influences um were pretty much vast like uh like me and Exus was, right? Um, with her, her dad being a promoter or whatnot. My dad was a postal worker, but he had a wide range of, of, of albums, you know, so I don't have anything in my house from a Whitney Houston, Anita Baker, Luther Vandross, and then I would turn around and have a Ramsey Lewis record. And then you'll turn around, there'll be a Three Dog Night record, a total, <laughs> right? So yeah. a total a White Heat or the average white band uh, and so on and so forth, you know, of uh, Steely Dan, um, um, uh, what's one? I was just putting my homeboy on this one. Seals and Cross, um, uh, Steel Nash, Young Crosby. I forget, I said it in the wrong order, but those guys, right? Crosby, Steels, Nash, and Young. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Who all be fatty special slugs, lettuce, cheese, pickles, like no sesame my mustache. That's all good, but uh, but you know, it's a wide range of it, and uh, and you can listen to um. If you follow Manny Fresh's production, especially his early production, where he will pull um, rhythms from and stuff, you know, they come from a wide range of music. Wide range of music. It's very much a mirror of how hip hop was started. You know, it was just like a, a, a whole new lane. Same same process, whole new lane because it, it came from a different region and stuff. So, um, and all those records, and I'm, and I'm actually glad I, I I actually stole my dad's records. Cause we moved when I went to college. I know you went to. Uh, you said you went to Grambling Bank. I went to Southern. We'll talk about that later. So, uh, <laughs> I, uh, he when we moved, I went to college. They moved into an apartment, and that's when I started making beats. And he had when I would go back home, I noticed he kept all those records just in the bottom of his closet. So little by little, when I would come home <laughs> for the weekend, I would just steal a bunch of them and go back to school. Steal a bunch of them, go back to school. He never noticed. And then uh, Katrina came, and had I left him with them records, I wouldn't have those records right now. Um, so, so we don't condone stealing. Say it again. So we don't condone stealing. He acquired them. Yeah. yeah. Well, at, at Grambling, we acquire things. <laughs> <laughs> Semantics. Semantics. You know. so the last thing I want to leave you with. So Jason, you had asked um, who influenced them, like who would have influenced Miss T. So. Um, Every the the age differentials were really close, but if you ask anybody like from Miss T's age on, they all say Mia X was of course their number one uh, influence. But when you go back to Mia, who is turning fifty this year, I believe she's forty nine now. Maybe she just turned fifty. I can't remember. But um, but she talks about how everybody her age there wasn't anybody to look up to. They were literally you know doing it as they went along. And so what she did was look up to um, people in female musicians in rhythm and blues, female musicians in rock, um, and tried to pull things from their energy, their persona, the, their stage presence, not necessarily the sound of the music, but the kind of energy that the female performers brought. And so she would take from that and then create her own image and her own sound moving forward. Thank you. That was great. Well, thank uh-huh. you, everybody. We really appreciate it. Sorry that YouTube is broken tonight. I don't know what the deal is with that. But let's hope that it's fixed by next week. And then we will be on our way into No Limit and Cash Money. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. See you next week. <laughs>